queuing. It was a longer queue to take a picture with you than the food, queuing for food, you know. That's how crucial it was, intense it was outside. Okay, that's Stephen Lim calling upon our second speaker. Alright, okay. Founder of the YouTube channel Genie Boy TV, who first gained fame as a radio host for Malaysia's number one English language station. His work with such musicians as Pixie Lot, Grace and Chance, and Kina Granis. Now he runs an award winning creative production house that creates content both for a wide audience and for brands for various digital platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Genie Boy! Alright, and now calling upon our third speaker on stage, one of Southeast Asia's most recognized and successful young entrepreneurs, Joel is currently the founder of Faith, a leading mobile payment and reward platform with strong presence in Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Joel Neo, founder of Faith. Gentlemen, please welcome on stage our amazing moderator, Mr. Christopher Tok. <laughs> all right, all right. Wow, this is the session we've been waiting for. I think uh, all of us are excited uh, to have these three gentlemen who are all taller than me, more handsome than me, and probably earn so much more than me. Um, <laughs> And probably all of us, a lot of us as well. So um, I think this is a, a good session to talk about brand storytelling. Right? It is about brand storytelling. Brand storytelling is, to me, the most important thing for every person, brand, and uh, company out there, even B two B brands right now. Because brand storytelling does a lot of things. Right? One of the things, one of the things that it does is that it reduces our ad spend. Right? When, how did you hear of these brands? Did they have to pay for the brands? Did you see that on their Facebook ads? Did you have to see it on posters, digital ads? No, you didn't. All you need to do was to open up your Facebook or your YouTube uh, feed and you'll see their, their content like displayed probably to, for, to you with over a million views and that itself is pure marketing. And for you, you'll be sharing them, you'll be talking about it, you'll be, you'll be putting comments and when you do that, your friends will be seeing it and that's how all these people got famous, right? But is it really as easy to do this? Was it easy to just create videos and immediately expect 100,000 views, 100,000 comments, 100,000 shares? Was it that easy? And, and this is exactly what we want to hear from our, our panelists. So this is how we're gonna do this. We are, I'm gonna invite our, our panelists to share about their story, how they got from zero to a hero. And, uh, and, and after that, uh, after all three is done, we're going to sit them down and, and pose some really tough questions. So I don't want you to just uh, rely on myself. I will I'd be expecting questions from you as well. So please prepare some questions for our gentlemen here because uh, they'll be more than happy to answer them, right? Okay, good. They're not nodding, but they, they are agreeing in their hearts. Okay, so without further ado, I'll invite our first speaker, all right, Ginny. Um, Jin will be sharing about how he made it, and I think it's a really good story. Um, I, for one, has been have been following him since the uh, uh, My Generacy video. Was that? How many of you watched the My Generacy video? Yeah. Oh, not so many of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and that to me was amazing, right? It was a video of unity. It was a video that, in the times of uh, while everybody is like trying to fight each other, they're like, oh wow, look, that was my past. That was how I, I grew up in Sekolah Renda and uh, the games I used to play. So it, it, it was so warm, it was so good that after that, every other video that he he produced um, uh, was basically you know shared by me, seen by me, and probably all my other friends. So please welcome. Jimmy Boy of uh, Jin of Jimmy Boy TV. 
Hi, I'm, I'm supposed to stand here, right? Okay, cool. Um, this is very awkward. But, uh, some of you may know me uh, as this guy who makes videos on YouTube. Some of you may know me from a radio station uh, called Hits FM. For those of you who know me from Hits FM, you're old. Because that was me about eight to nine years ago. Um, I started a YouTube channel because I was in traditional media. I was doing radio and I saw this huge amount of content on the digital platform. At that point in time, we only had Vimeo, we had Blogspot, and we had all those bloggers, and we didn't have Instagram. Instagram wasn't great yet. We had YouTube, and I discovered YouTube when I was in Australia, when the internet connection was 10 times faster than Malaysian internet connection. And when you press play, you don't have a buffer logo. So that's why I got to know about YouTube, and I learned all there is to know about video editing for YouTube. I went in to study marketing, told my mother I'm studying marketing, but I came back learning how to edit videos. So that's basically me. Um, I just like any, or just like most of you, I started as a marketing executive in Astro. I was writing scripts and commercials for radio. So all the commercials that you hear on radio, I apologize, but of course some of them stuck with you. So some of the campaigns that you hear in radio, that's what I used to do. And what happened after that was I was offered a job in radio and I did it for seven years. And in between that seven years, I discovered YouTube and I loved making videos and I said that, hey, if they could listen to me interview their favorite artists on radio, I would like to capture it on video and upload it on YouTube so that you can hear me and you can watch me as well. And I did that and I think we were the first station uh, at that point in time to do such things. So what happened after that was Hits basically took that and made it in the department. So I was left with nothing to do. And that's why I basically turned to making films for myself. I wrote stuff that I thought were funny. And the only person that thought it was funny was my mom and my wife, girlfriend back then. And I had no expectations of what I was going to do. I knew that I learned a lot of things on YouTube about shooting with a camera that I did not own. I knew all I needed to know about using a software to edit videos with a software that I downloaded legally. <laughs> and and that's, that's all I needed to make my first film. No expectations, nothing. And it has brought me here today, speaking to a bunch of people who just had lunch and probably want to sleep rather than listen to me talk. So that's my journey. And that is the journey that I went through with social media. I didn't have anyone backing me when I was, you know, when I had this idea to upload something on YouTube. A lot of people were putting me down. My employees were saying, don't waste your time, focus on your day job and focus on what really matters and pays the bills. But for me it was, I decided to do it as a hobby. But a hobby became something of a passion. Something so passionate became a business. And a business is now, something that I have to think of a day-to-day -day basis from something that involves so small with just me and another person that's half my size and half my height. And now we're running a company with about 20 people and a few talents that we basically work with brands together to basically amplify what they want to tell, amplify what they want to show, amplify what they want to put out there for their end consumers. And I'm not saying that I'm the only one that's doing it. Right after we started this whole social media thing, there have been a lot of people starting their own YouTube channels. There have been influencers sprouting left, right, center. Right now, it is the biggest market that any brand wants to dip their toes into. I mean, we get calls all the time or people asking us saying, hey, how do we do this? How do we do this? This is our first time doing it. This is our first time doing it. And it's only gonna get bigger than that. So for us, is we specialize in storytelling and we specialize in brand integration and working with brands to tell their campaigns through our stories. So, in a nutshell, that is what I do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And um, next up, we have Stephen. So, I think I need to introduce you again, right? You just do your bit. All right. For the next ten minutes. <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Lim. I. That's my number one fan back there, actually. And um, for those of you who don't know, um, I am an executive producer at BuzzFeed. I created and host one of the biggest food shows on the internet, which is a show called Worth It. And on the show, we try three foods at three drastically different price points. 
and we find out which one is the most worth it. And it's a lot of fun. We get to eat the most delicious foods in the world, travel to the most amazing places. But from the beginning, I actually was never really into food. I actually didn't really care much. I used to love eating McDonald's and Subway and everything. And the reason why I got into media actually was from the very beginning. Um, if you go way back in time, my parents are actually both from Malaysia and they both immigrated to the States for university. And then after a few years, they, I think, forgot to come back to Malaysia. <laughs> and they stayed stuck around, stuck around. And uh, so I grew up in the States and I grew up around a lot of non-Asian people. And because of that, I was kind of confused about my identity for a long time. I was looking around and it was mostly non-Asians, so I thought, oh, I must be just like them. And, but then I realized, you know, in middle school and in high school, people would call me the Asian kid, which you would, I guess here you would not hear that, but in, in the States, in the very small town, it was like that. And it made me realize I wanted to actually make content to help represent my people in America better. Because I felt like people didn't even, like people would be like, oh, you are Chinese, right? So you're from China. And I would say, no, no, my family's from Malaysia. And they would say, okay, where or what is Malaysia? They don't even know. And so I wanted to represent my people from, from very beginning because I just felt like there wasn't representation in American media. So fast forward a few years and my college engineering degree, I graduated from university with an engineering degree and I started working at a company called Procter & Gamble. We, I worked on laundry detergent for about two years. Yeah, it's very exciting, on soap. And um, I actually realized though that I did not care about soap. And so I started to make videos on the side with my iPhone. And in, uh, in my free time, I would just pull out my phone and I would start writing scripts and I would start shooting stuff. And I realized that I really fell in love with the process of making videos. And then that was like, I can combine this passion for making videos with my desire to make content for Asians in America and use that to tell my own story. And so I've, I've been in now YouTube for about six or seven years now. And you know, I would say the first three or four years of that was just a process of learning how to make content. A lot of failures, a lot of videos that were not very good. And over time though, I made a video that, that did go viral on the internet. The video is called Asian Parents React to I Love You where uh, I called my mom and told her I love her, and I recorded her reaction. It's very uh, cute and heartwarming, so you can look at that later. And so BuzzFeed saw that video, and they called me, and they told me to uh, come work for them. And so that was actually the beginning of, of me at BuzzFeed, and my goal from the beginning was never to be on camera, actually. I just wanted to make content that represented my people, like I've been saying. And so I would make these videos that were like really, really hardcore kind of, uh, you know, identity videos. And the non-Asians that watched it didn't really care about it. And I was like, why don't you guys care about who I am? And then I realized the way that I can communicate with these people, the best way I can, I can actually connect with them is through the medium of food. Because food is this universal language that anybody from any corner of the world to the other corner will all have the same language, which is their taste. And that actually was the reason why I started to do food content, so that I could talk about my identity and to talk about my upbringing and my story. And so over time, I started to think of different concepts and different concepts, and what are ways that I could just connect with different people? And, not, and, and with that, you know, everybody thinks about food, and they also think about money. And so the, the, the whole premise of the show is we do like a $5 burger and we eat a $10 burger and then we eat like a $500 burger. And I think anybody, no matter where you are, can relate to not probably wanting to buy a $500 burger. But we want to see how crazy is that? How much do people want to try that? So that's actually, from, from there, the, the show, we, we put it online. And I just thought, you know, this is something that everybody can relate to. And from the first week, that video had around 10 million views. And it was, so crazy. I had no idea that so many people all around the world would connect with this. And it was really cool because I got to also share stories about my upbringing. In the videos, I call my mom a lot and I ask her how she's doing and she tells her story about, you know, about our upbringing and what we ate and all these things I really, really, want, really resonated with. So I would say, in terms of building my brand, the whole idea of building my brand was just to create something that really meant a lot to me and hope that other people would relate to that. 
and then finding the right medium and the right tool to connect with those people. So for me, it was all about representation, and then the tool was video and food. And I think no matter who you're talking to, no matter you know where you are in the world, it's really important to find that one connection point. So for me, building a brand hasn't just been about, okay, how many views do we have, or what can we sell, or how can we leverage uh, analytics to get more uh, ad dollars. But no, it's really just about connecting with people and having empathy. So that's my story in a nutshell. I'll uh, shut up now, but thank you guys for listening. Wow. <laughs> guys, I don't know about you, but I'm tearing. I'm, I'm tearing because I had this dream a long time ago, and everyone was saying, you know, Malaysia is boring, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's nobody who can create good content. And uh, before this whole uh, the G Boy thing came up and all the other Dan Goose and all, you know, sometimes we fail to see the people who are doing great things. And this is the guy, Stephen is the guy that talks about Malaysia, even though he's, he's technically not Malaysian. Um, you know, are you, are you in Malaysia? You're not, right? Technically, uh, I, I say that I'm Malaysian Chinese American. That's what I say. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So, can you have a round of applause for Stephen? Proud. Malaysian, Malaysian, Malaysian Chinese American. Okay, think about it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, before any funny uh, <laughs> jokes come out, uh, let's have Joel's um, story. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I don't have a surname Lim, right? So that's Jin Lim, Steve Lim, Joel Lim, right? Um, a lot of diversity on the, on this uh, couch, you know, for Asian kids. Um, so a bit different, right? Uh, you know, since they, they started with their parents, so I'm forced and compelled to start with my parents as well. Um, so my mom and my dad, uh, they're educationists. My mom's a teacher at my school. Uh, so my life was kind of charted that I could only have four options, which was either being a lawyer, doctor, engineer, or accountant, ever since I grew up, right? Um, and uh, when, when I was growing up, then you know, one day I realized that I was not interested in any of those four professions, uh, and I wanted to be, I wanted to start a company, I wanted to build like a startup. Uh, so I didn't know where to get started, and back then in 2007, people were still watching television, so that was when Genie Boy was not famous yet. Uh, he was still, you're just listening to his voice. <laughs> were, you, were you speaking on, on radio? Yeah. 2007? Uh, no, no, not yet. Okay, not yet. Yeah. He's probably still in um, college. Yeah. Right, so um, so at that point of time, uh, you know, people still watching TV. And uh, so um, somehow there was uh, this very popular TV show called The Apprentice, um, where Donald Trump was the, the guy who was firing people. And somehow now he's the president of the United States of America. <laughs> so. Uh, and it's kind of, kind of strange if you think about it, it was, you know, not more than, it was kind of like around 10 years ago. So uh, I joined a very similar TV show in Malaysia, um, uh, which was like The Apprentice, and uh, as the youngest contestant, somehow I won the TV show. So uh, after the TV show, what happened was a lot of media started to interview me. They said, oh, right, you know, you're a successful entrepreneur, you know, you're this, you're that, right? And uh, to some extent, I, I realized that I wasn't, I was just starting up. I didn't even have a successful company. So um, actually, I became really kind of um, somewhat depressed uh, because on the outside, people said, wow, you're this entrepreneur, young people asking me, how do you start a company? I don't even know how to start a company. Yeah? I don't even know what to build, um, you know, what, what kind of companies to build. Um, so that's when I decided to maybe to take a step back. So I stopped talking to the media, you know, I, I kind of went back kind of into my little like office and started to think about, um, you know, kind of living through that brand, right? Um, you know, the brand that people are saying, hey, if you're an entrepreneur, then I said, better walk the talk. So, um, so that's when I, I realized that the internet was a really powerful means as a young person, because, um, you know, I didn't have much capital to start a business. Um, and typically, I realized when I read Forbes magazine, there's only two types of entrepreneurs uh, that were successful when they were young. Uh, the first is if they have a very rich family, and then they go in and take one part of the family business and make it really successful. Uh, the other is technology. So I went back home, I looked at my parents and their house, and I realized there was not much assets here, unless I decide to sell my parents home and you know, make them homeless. Uh, that's one way, right? Or the other way is use technology. So that's kind of how I started my first internet startup. Uh, and that point of time, media was uh, fragmented. It was quite interesting because uh, a lot of advertisers were still advertising on newspapers and television when actually people were starting to go on the internet. So we started this uh, small website called Says, 
Um, and essentially, it was uh, the idea of it is uh, not everyone's like Jin or like Steve who's really popular. Uh, there are a lot of people who like to kind of voice, you know, they have like small following. So we built like, uh, you know, thousands of small uh, influencers to onto one platform where they can kind of uh, create social news. So we believe that news was going to be created by people and going to be read by people online. Uh, and then we started to make a profit. And one thing we realized about uh, brand and uh, uh, the branding aspect is that for media, it's very difficult to to cover a wide range of demographics with one brand. So like Says was very urban, was English speaking. It was very hard to penetrate Chinese speaking or Malay speaking uh, uh, individuals, old, young, they're all very different. So then we started to look into media companies and we realized the largest media companies were all, uh, has all grown through uh, mergers and acquisitions. So we started to take some of our profits and we started to buy companies. Uh, so we started to buy a Malay website, you know, because none of us in our team spoke Malay, right? So we said, okay, uh, these guys are the second largest site, so we acquired it. And then we acquired a Chinese website, and we went on to acquire about eight companies. So we took the company public, and then eventually got acquired by the largest media company in Malaysia. So that was kind of the first company I started, uh, which exited, and then uh, which was called Ref Asia. And then secondly, from then I realized that e-commerce was next, you know, if people were buying stuff online in the US and Europe, why not in Malaysia? Why not in Southeast Asia? So we first started a coupon company um, that eventually became Groupon and uh, we scaled it across uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, and today it's sold, it sold like 10 billion coupons, right, online. Uh, so that was the second business uh, I started and uh, exited to Groupon. Uh, but the learnings from Groupon was, was that uh, while customers liked the discounts, actually the businesses were suffering because the 60% discount had to come somewhere, right? And uh, that's why we realized that while customers liked it initially, the problem was that when customers were redeeming it, it's not really our customers, it is our merchants' customers. So when our merchants start to treat our customers bad, then our customers start to, uh, or they stop buying coupons. So that's when uh, I started uh, another company called Fave, which is the third company about four years ago. Uh, so with that learnings, uh, we decided to start a, a platform uh, to give technology to small medium merchants. So that's uh, the mission. Uh, reason being is because, um, I, you know, I've been in, in like technology conferences, working with internet startups. I've invested in 20 startups today. And I find that uh, one thing that's interesting is that, uh, you know, it, it's really nice and sexy, you know, uh, uh, young people, technology, getting investments. But actually there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are running uh, offline businesses, like restaurants, cafes, they're doing a lot of hard work where they, they find it very difficult to grow their business. So what we are doing right now with Fave is building technology for uh, small medium businesses so that they can actually bridge into the cashless world and uh, grow their business uh, in, in the cashless world. So that's kind of uh, the path now with Fave. Uh, it's the third company and I'm uh, pretty excited. So thanks, uh, Shaho, for having me here. Uh, really privileged to be here with all of you. Uh, thank you. So how many here is a user of Fave Pay? Wow, look at that. So that's the guy. That's the guy that founded it with this team. So, if there's one thing in common, I would think that they were really, really cool mothers. Is that right? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so, I, I'm, I'm kidding. But um, storytelling, uh, brand storytelling, I think, puts a big major feature on, on how these guys achieve their success. And if I'm you, I probably want to know what's the secret, what's the underlying secret behind uh, building the large brands that you guys uh, have built, right? So, um, uh, Joel, maybe you can share with us what made um, you know your three brands so successful. How, why would people trust um, you know their money, their time, and uh, you know faith pay wasn't easy, right? Uh, for these people to to uh, to believe that oh, there's something that, they, that that can replace something that I'm used to using cash, that must not be easy. So, what is what have you built within the brands that made it so successful as it as it is now? Yeah, so I think for uh, maybe my perspective and Jane and Steve may be a bit different. So, uh, so what we do is, uh, you know, we were a startup where we, uh, you know, we sort of build platforms. Uh, and these platforms typically connect businesses and consumers. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, maybe everyone in this room would understand uh, how a consumer views a platform, which is typically it's cheaper, faster, and uh, easier, right? I mean, uh, typically these are the three uh, key value propositions for a customer. Uh, but oftentimes, actually, there's a business element to it. So the success of what, how we've, how we've grown is actually it is a lot of it is starting on the business side. Uh, we work with about twenty thousand small medium business owners today uh, to actually help them to go cashless 
And uh, as they go cashless, we create a lot of different services for them, like loyalty service, uh, voucher service. Uh, there's table ordering as well, we just launched. So you can kind of, for a consumer, you can scan the QR code on the table in Singapore, and you can order your food and it comes to you within a couple of minutes. Uh, so things like that. So we, we built that platform that connects small business with consumers. Uh, but a lot of the hard work, 90% starts on the business side. Because if the business doesn't use the service or the technology, then it doesn't work for the consumer. So I think our secret sauce is actually working on the business. Right, right. So, so you would say that um, having a focus of the brand to the consumers was a major role. Because, I mean, you literally have to follow what they want and not what you want. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and uh, Jin, I mean, you know, when you first started this, uh, you said yourself that a lot of people were not, like, you know, not, not didn't believe that you'd be the brand that you are today. And, uh, you know, it must have stopped you at some point, like, um, you know, what, what are you doing this? I mean, you had a future in, 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 in uh, as a radio jockey, right? And um, you could be doing many things, acting and all these things. So why why build your own brand? How, how important was it to you? Um... Yeah, I could have been an actor. But then again, there's a saying that you have a face for radio and ta-da! Um, okay, so when I was working in traditional media, well, when you're working under someone, when you're working for an employer, a lot of people think that um, radio DJs get the limelight and it's amazing. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's the same as everybody going for a 9-to-5 job. We still are employees. We still have a job to do. Uh, just our job scopes are completely different. Um, when I was in traditional media, everything was just told to me and I had to follow every instruction. No matter how I wanted to basically sort of spread my wings a little bit and be a little bit different, we were governed by a lot of rules and laws and legalization that didn't allow us to kind of like, you know, do the certain things that we wanted to do. So in other words, you know, when you, have, when you work for such a huge corporate company, there are rules, there are, there are, there are, there's a lot of guidelines that you need to follow and stuff. Which is not wrong. It's it's okay. I mean, for it's 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 the way it is. It's just how a big company works. But for me, I just because I was surrounded by so much creativity. Like you know, I met so much. Uh, I met so many artists working in radio. I met so many actors. I met so many uh, musicians. I met you know whoever you listen to. There's chances are I have interviewed them before. And all these people had in common were the the ability to speak their mind and express themselves to the different forms of art that they put out there, be it music or uh, acting. So for me, it, was, it wasn't something that I set out to do, to be honest. To be honest, I didn't know what I was doing. Even my mom was like, what the hell are you doing? Um, I, when I started making videos and making short films and stuff like that, it was just a one, it's supposed to be a one-off thing. And for me, it was that I'm doing this because I love doing it and I found a cheaper way because I, I inquired. Oh, what does it take for me to get a camera that can film some... Well, my, this is my question. I want a camera that will make the person sharp, but the background blur blur. Yeah. And then, you know, nice nice color, like the movie you see one, you know? And then after that, the guy comes back, okay, uh, this camera costs $200,000. like, Oh, that's really expensive. Then after that, I found out that you can, that you can do that with another camera and achieve the same thing with software and technology and it's about the same and I'm like oh okay but how come this one's so cheap this one's so expensive now my so I went to my friend who owned this because I didn't have the camera and I used it and I realized that oh cool I can achieve this too and that's all I did I didn't know what I was doing I made a film that I thought looked like something that was in the movies I was so naive right and now when I compare the movies oh my god this is like crap but at that point in time I found a way to achieve what I thought looked great at that point in time and only I thought it was great, nobody else. But when I uploaded it online, more than one person think it was cool. And a lot of people started sharing the video. And when they started sharing the video, I got a little bit scared because my first video was making fun of Canon. And uh, we were making fun of all the Chinese salesmen in, in, in shopping malls. On the third day, the legal department of Canon called me up and they said they wanted to sue me. And I'm like, oh crap. Then after that, the fourth, fifth, fifth, the next day, the marketing department of Canada called me and they said they want to work with me. So I was like, okay, you call your legal department and tell them to not sue me, I'll work with you. Deal? <laughs> Alright, cool. So that's how it happened. And that's when I realized that, yes, um, a lot of people think that, uh, will question me, like the question now, how did you build your brand? How did you build your brand? How did you build your brand? The, my answer to that would be, the people built my brand. 
the end consumer built my brand. They believed in the story I was telling. They were the ones who shared the video. They are the ones who said, hey, check out this video, they're stupid, they're funny, you know what I mean? They were the ones that hit share. They were the ones that built the brand. They were the ones, in the long run, who were going to determine what Ginny Boy TV was going to be like. They were the ones who were going to be the ones telling their friends, that, oh, this is a channel about uh, Malaysian stories. It wasn't me going out selling myself, I am this, 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 this. For me, is I did whatever I could in my greatest capability, but it was the audience that brought the brand to another level that enabled us to work with brands and money and sponsorship money to better ourselves and have these people share the journey of us growing. So yeah, my answer dad's a little bit different. It's not so much me, it's basically the people who helped build my brand. Nice answer. And uh, Stephen, so I think one of the part of the problem of building a brand is that sometimes you gotta, uh, and there's a fine balance, right, between building a brand and making money. So how do you, you know, how do you differentiate between uh, what builds a brand and, you know, doesn't, doesn't go too far away from what you want to uh, do, but at the same time, you know, you gotta to, to make the money to make a living, right? And maybe that, the answer is for you too, Jane, after this. Yeah, so. Yeah, so <laughs> making money, that's the question that we all want to know, right? Um, for the show, the, the first question that I asked was not to make, it wasn't like how do I make money actually. The first question I asked is how do I make a show that's going to stand out? And how it's going to be, there's a million food shows on TV, on the internet, they all have something in common, but how am I going to make something that is different? And so that's my starting point. And the starting point was, okay, I watch these food shows, and these food shows are talking about, you know, the mouthfeel of the food and like the things that you don't, when you're eating dinner, you don't talk about these things. And I was thinking, well, when I go to dinner, all I think is, how much is it gonna cost me? And I think, is it gonna be good? And so I tried to take it back to the simplicity of that and think, what is a food show that's going to talk about things that real people actually talk about when they're eating over dinner. And so, and, and that probably goes back to any of the, you know, I would say brands or shows or, or videos that I've built is trying to think about it from the, maybe the simplest standpoint of what is the thing that, you know, somebody's gonna connect to on a more personal level. And then from there, we were able to build the show. We built the content and uh, the first two or three seasons, we actually did not have any sponsors for the show. We were only living on ad dollars and uh, thankfully, I worked for BuzzFeed, so BuzzFeed was able to fund the, the, the product at first. But over time, then we had to figure out, okay, how are we going to integrate brands into this show? And a lot of brands would come in and say, oh, uh, we're McDonald's, can you do a video where you compare McDonald's hash brown to like McDonald's uh, Big Mac? And from my perspective, I don't want to do that. Not that I don't like McDonald's, I love McDonald's, but the problem with that was that I didn't want the brand to determine the creative of what I was trying to do or trying to influence the change of, change of what I was doing. So really the question then was how are we going to work with brands and that, the key to that is being creative and problem solving. So if we do want to work with McDonald's, we want to work with them in a way where, where they're not sponsoring a food episode but maybe they can sponsor a non-food episode. That way the audience is not going to be like, oh. McDonald's is influencing you guys too much to, to kind of sell your product. Instead, why don't we just integrate McDonald's into maybe a video about uh, cars? Because you know that they're not gonna they're not gonna be uh, influencing my opinion on cars. So that's something that we had to work around in terms of like, okay, going to the brand saying we don't want to do what you're saying, but we have a better idea. We have something that actually we think will resonate with the audience more. They're actually gonna love it and. And so the last few seasons, actually, we've been working with different brands, um, trying to integrate items into our show that, that makes sense. And that's really what's keeping it afloat now is advertising. So the last season of work that we actually are driving a, like a BMW, we're working with BMW for this one. And, you know, it's like, they're not influencing the creator of the show, but we just drive around in the car and everybody's happy. So um, we try to really just be creative and manage expectation with the brands. And that's probably, yeah, the number one thing. So that's your relationship with brands, right? But Jin, I mean, I think the YouTubers here, uh, or the video content creators here, they have a hard time with fans. 
So the more ads you do, the more they're going to say, oh, you know, that's not who you are, and, you know, um, I believe in you, but now you're selling us short, so how do you deal with that? I block them. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, in the industry that we are working in, it takes a lot of education towards the clients that we work with, and a lot of trial and error. Um, and a lot of case study like when someone comes up to you and gives you X amount of money they'd be like the first thing is the first thing that goes to the top of their mind is I'm gonna make whatever I spend worth it um, <laughs> and I want to make sure that I make my money's worth in terms of like oh I'm sponsoring this uh, short film I want to make sure that my brand goes here 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 but we have approached a lot of clients who think like that but it doesn't mean that there are no clients out there who also understand where we're coming from. So we're very fortunate to have worked with a lot of brands who basically gave us full creative control uh, in order for us to basically tell a story about their product our way. Um, for the lack of a better, uh, for the lack of a better representation, for me, is I think the, the best brand that we work with is Samsung. Uh, we've been working with Samsung for almost like five years right now, and. At a, one point of time, what they wanted us to do was to create content that we usually do on our channel and place it up on their platform. Like if they came up to me and said, hey look, I've got the S8, um, how would you promote it? I'm going to give you full creative control. And then we did it according to what we thought was funny. And then they enjoyed the relationship and the creativity that we were giving because it was a little bit more relatable in that sense. They gave us a note, they said that, hey, how would you promote the S Pen or how would you promote the camera? So the, the commercial side of it will basically tell you to lift up the phone like that and then have like freaking supers pointing here pointing oh 24.9 megapixel camera the S Pen oh the M Super AMOLED but what we did was we wrote a film about this guy who was trying to peep in a girl and he wants to show his friends how hot she is the girl sitting here so he pretended to do a call and he took a picture but the flash came off and that's how we promoted the phone. And that video basically was, uh, well, it went viral and it was redistributed on a few different platforms. And Samsung came back and said that, wow, really cost effective. We only pay you this much, but we had about 10 million uh, distributions across uh, India, Thailand, and everything. And I was like, ah, damn it. <laughs> Should touch you more next time. Um, so I guess it's a lot of education, a lot of understanding, and a lot of collaboration. It needs, like today, the reason why we work with, we enjoy working with Samsung is because they come to us with an idea. I'll give you a very good example. Their, their campaign for the past few years is, is talking about do what you can't. That has been their tagline for the past few years. So this year was their first time doing a Chinese New Year commercial video and they've never done so at all. And they came to us and they said that, hey, um, we want to make a Chinese New Year commercial, um, but we want it on your platform. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Um, and the thing is, they were like, okay, so how do we do this? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. And that's where they said that, okay, do whatever you want. I'm not going to limit your creativity. I just want you to, I mean, obviously, if the person is using a phone, use our phones, just don't use any other phones. So we wrote a story about the digital divide between our young children and the millennials with their grandparents. Because when your grandparents or your older, your elder parents use phones, number one, you're always very impatient teaching your parents how to use their mobile phones. I see a very slight nod from everyone. <laughs> and most of the time when you teach them something like Facebook, they're gonna probably embarrass you by leaving comments on your Facebook com your Facebook posts or whatever not. And you know, you're gonna be like, Mom, that's so not cool. Your parents are probably gonna go out with their mobile phones and play Pokemon when the trend has already died like two years ago. So we did that. We brought all of the elements that's relatable into that one film uh, with the one message according to the whole do what you can't campaign is basically this is you helping your elders keep connected with you. So that's the underlying story and they loved it. So when we released it uh, in Malaysia, it resonated so well with all of the audiences. Audiences, Singapore came, took, the, took, our, <laughs> took our video, released it in Singapore as a Singapore's Chinese New Year commercial. So, they were, it's all about educating, it's all about collaborating, it's all about understanding what they want and it's all about them understanding what works best on your platform. Because to be honest, if they wanted something completely different, they could have gone to another creator. They didn't. There's not only Ginny Boy TV in Malaysia, there's so many, there's MGAG, there's So I'm Jen, there's, um, there's Dan Koo Productions, there's Greenfields, there's so many for you to choose from. You know, you can have like 10 different pitches from 10 different YouTube channels. But of course, 
the brand at the end of the day makes the decision who works the best with us. Yeah. Wow, I hope the brands here are listening to this and uh, you know. please spend with us, thank you. <laughs> Good plan. Okay guys, so let, let's open this uh, conversation, uh, question and answers to all of you guys. So anyone wants to ask the first question? Come on guys. I just literally told them that there will be a lot of people who will be asking questions. Okay, there you go. One, thank you. <laughs> Two, behind there. Alright, so we have a few now. Um, anyone, Mike, please, guys? I, mean, I can just yell if you really want me to at this point. Um, okay, do it. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Christine. I'm from uh, uh, BFM, but my question is slightly more personal. So I was wondering, especially for uh, Ginny Boy specifically, you had to deal with multiple transitions in your career, not just from working for a corporation and then becoming an independent content creator to also starting your own business and taking that into like that space. So what was that second transition like specifically? Oh, thanks. I have the mic now. Uh, uh, maybe you so can repeat your question. I was trying very hard because, you know, I'm old. I'm a bit deaf. All right, I'll repeat the question uh, for everyone to hear too. So, basically my question was that you have gone through a lot of career transitions in your life. Um, not only from working for a corporation with those resources to becoming an independent content creator, but then moving from that to starting your own business, right? So, I wanted to ask about that second transition specifically and what were the challenges that you faced in that and how have you kind of dealt with that? Oh. The biggest, the, the biggest problem in that second transition when after I realized that okay I was creating content and I was starting I was I, I should start a business for what I'm doing right now right. The biggest problem I had was you know okay to be honest I wish I had Joel's brains so at least I know how to run a business and then sell my company for millions and millions of dollars and then exit. <laughs> um, but the biggest challenge with that was yeah understanding how a business runs. To be honest, we don't know. But it doesn't mean that it, it, that shouldn't limit you. For me, it was I was too afraid to go out and ask help from people because most of the time people be like, "Huh? What do you mean?" Um, we were in a position where, to be honest, we were the. I would say it's not it's not a great thing to say this. We were the first to do it, and we were, when we were trying to monetize it, it was tough because a lot of production houses hated us because they thought we were spoiling the market. Um, a lot of media agencies or media houses, even Astro, or I'm not sure where the BFM, but or yeah, like, we're cool, we're cool. yeah, the traditional media thought that what are these guys? They're spoiling the market, you know. But and I have friends from Astro coming to me and saying that hey, you guys are spoiling the market, lah, you know. Um, but when we talk to clients and stuff like that, you know, they'd be like, okay, yeah, we're cheaper. So the thing is, so that was one problem. How do we charge, you know? If we want to charge something like what production houses charge us, they'd be like, oh, I'd rather go to a production house. But when we charge too cheap, you know, uh, people will be like, oh, you guys are just like freaking spoiling the market and every you're bringing everything down. So that was, those were some of the challenges I faced uh, when running a business. Um, and of course, the bigger challenges when you get brands involved with your original content is the flexibility on how much you want to let the brand dictate whatever you put up online. And for me is, I was very protective of whatever I put online. So that's why for the first year, I was broke because we didn't do any brand deals. We, the first brand deal we ever did, the first brand deal, uh, and today I will always talk about this, is uh, a brand deal that we did with a, a college, of uh, Inti College, they came up to us, and their brief is very simple. Hey, Teacher's Day is coming, I want you to make a video about teachers, that's it. And what they wanted was to take that video and put it into a CD. <laughs> Wow. I know, right? A CD. A compact disc. And distributed to teachers around the Klang Valley and in Malaysia with a rose. With a rose saying that, thank you teachers, you are the best. So we wrote a film about teachers. And you know, all it, all, all, and it became a big 360 campaign where we had the video online, we had the CDs <laughs> be distributed to teachers who will then come back and say, I'd rather watch it online because, you know, I don't have a CD-ROM at home. And, you know, it kind of, then it worked really, really well for them. And then when we did that, a lot of other brands came up to us and say, hey, we want to work with you too. But it was a very big problem in trying to help them understand that, hey, it's not about me trying to mention your brand 10,000 times in three minutes so that people will understand what we're promoting. Because I'd like to think that our viewers are not dumb. Our viewers are very, very smart. You know, when they choose to watch whatever you're putting out there, 
our audiences basically choose what to consume, and they're not. It's it's not it's not hard for them to realize whether it's a collaboration or it's a non-collaboration. You, you know what I mean? So those were some of the challenges, but the thing is, education is key. That's the most important thing. You have to constantly basically talk to your clients. You need to constantly work with other brands and bring these case studies to your clients and tell them, hey, this is a campaign that we did with HB. It worked. Would you like to do the same thing? If you'd like to do the same thing, here are some stories that we want you to sponsor. No? Okay, cool. What's your brief? All right, we're gonna go back, talk out team. This is what we can do. Will this work for you? Yes or no, be very, be very honest about it. If it doesn't work for you, then okay, cool. Let's not force it. Maybe you should look with some, look for it. Maybe BFM will be more than happy to basically be a little bit more direct and more informational. Maybe say, says.com, you know, you know, for people who are writing articles who will be able to in integrate. There's so, the, the, the whole industry is so large that it doesn't just rely on one platform to market your brand. And we are very open with our brands. Look, if we don't cut it for you, don't force yourself on us. It's not that we don't want your money, we want your money. <laughs> Yeah, we want your money. But if it doesn't work for us, it's gonna hurt our brand, it's gonna hurt our credibility, and it's gonna hurt your credibility as a brand as well. So, yeah, that's an ongoing struggle until today. Uh, as a kind of follow-up question to that right though, has it actually, I mean, has it gotten slightly easier with the mere fact that, you know, um, there has been a rise in, in the people who are doing similar things to you, and, there, and that is a, um, a sort of a, a rising trend, I suppose. Is it easy to explain to companies uh, because that's um, a kind of better known now, or is it still as difficult to be like, just let me do what I want to do? <laughs> um, I, okay. 50 50. Okay. There are a lot of creators that are coming up, but not every person who runs a YouTube channel knows how to run a business. Not every YouTuber that has 10 million followers knows how to speak to a client. Because when someone goes up to someone and says, yeah, I've got $20,000 for you to make a video. Oh man, that's a lot of money. Okay, I'll do it. And then you have someone who's like, no, I'm not gonna do it. Then you go to another person, okay, I'll do it. It's so big right now. If I'm not gonna do it, someone else is gonna do it. So, you know, it's your own, at the end of the day, it's your own, it's your own conscious, okay? Just because that somebody else is gonna do it, are you gonna play the competitive card and like, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna take it because if I don't take it, someone else is gonna take it. So it's gonna, it's, it's been difficult out there because you know, right now all the brands. I'm not sure if anybody's from any brands over here. You guys are in a great position because you are spot for choice. There's so many influencers out there, you know. Show legs, <laughs> post a picture. That's one influencer. That's the type. That's the type of a YouTuber. That ten types of this. That's another one. There's like, you know, another one that basically goes out making food shows. That's another one. So there's so many avenues for you to basically choose to market your brand. So, I'm technically, I'm in a losing end here by saying this, but the brands have such an amazing menu of creators and platforms out there to place your brand integrations anywhere you want. At the end of the day, yes, because brands have the money, money is king, but for people like me, because I stay true to what I believe in and what I create, the brands that I've worked with on a long-term basis keep coming back because they know it works. We don't just create content that goes on our platform, we create content and meaningful content for them to use on their solo own basis as well. So it has evolved to that market. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, there was a gentleman that before, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so, one, one uh, there was a gentleman behind, was there someone? If not, then I pass the Roberto. Okay, let's just go for the Roberto. The last resort, right? Um, <laughs> hey, hi guys. Um, so this is a question that's probably gonna be more appropriate for Joel. Joel, you shouldn't be surprised that I'm asking you a question. But no, I mean like, obviously when it comes to storytelling and brand storytelling, it's all the rage right now. Right, it's it's the trend. It's there's a whole ton of content about brand storytelling. You need to incorporate it in your business, etc. Now, obviously, for a business that is based on content, like you know, like Stephen and Ginny Boy, of course, it's your bread and butter, right? But Joel is somebody who's built you know multiple businesses in, in the more traditional vein, right, of offering some sort of service or some sort of product. Um, a more straightforward kind of thing, which doesn't necessarily rely on having a fancy story. At which point, like let, let's maybe talk about fave, right? The transition of fave. At which point 
did you or the marketing team or whoever start feeling that, yeah, okay, we really need to be telling stories here as opposed to just doing more straightforward marketing? Because we know our product is good, we're offering clear value, let's just communicate that and let the product speak for itself as opposed to having to create the whole, you know, the whole story behind it, etc. So where was the, at which point does it become important? Yeah, I think for us, um, so as a company, um, actually the most important starting point for brand storytelling is internally, right? It's our employees. Uh, so reason being, for example, Faith today has like 400 plus employees. So if our employees today does not understand what we are trying to do, uh, that's 80% of our costs or 90% of our costs every single month. Um, and oftentimes maybe you guys are in organizations where you are not clear, why is the company doing what you're, uh, why is the company doing a certain things, right? And oftentimes, uh, in the technology space, we evolve extremely quick. So if you look at it year on year, like last year, Fave was very different to two years ago and this year. Um, so in fact, like I spent a lot of time, not so much of external brand storytelling, but actually internal brand storytelling. And oftentimes that is um, a, a self-reflection, right? Uh, because a lot of times the extension of what we believe the company should be, then extends out uh, to all the different individuals in the team as well. Um, so I think that's that's the first starting point. If you are not clear in your own company why your company is doing a certain thing, or why are they doing, yeah. So I think that's the first question to ask, whether you are an employee or whether you are the employer. Yeah? Um, I think once we, we are clear on that, uh, as a platform, really our brand is what our customers say about us or what our merchants say about us. So, um, so essentially, when we first uh, started Faith, uh, we, within six months, we actually did a management buyout and acquired the Groupon business. So the first one year was a struggle to build the Faith brand because it was a local brand. Like it started in Kuala Lumpur, Bangsa South. Uh, we went three markets, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia. So everyone, like consumers, called us Pink Groupon for one year, right? People that joined the company said, oh yeah, I'm joining the Pink Groupon company. And that really kind of riled me up, right? Because that's exactly not, that was not what we wanted to be, right? Um, so we have Pink Groupon for one year. Our investors call us Pink Groupon as well, right? Um, but what I realized over time, uh, when the breakthrough happened for us was something about 18 months ago when I was in Singapore. So I was on the cab and then just talking to some of the, uh, I always like to talk to uh, kind of the cab drivers because they are actually the real powers of the society, right? And somehow one of the taxi drivers talked about faith. He said, hey, you're in Singapore, why don't you use faith to pay, right? And I thought, oh, wow, that's like, you know, I, I kind of recorded it and sent it to the team because it's the first time someone actually did not call us a pink coupon, right? Uh, and someone actually narrated faith in a way that we wanted it to be. So I think oftentimes for a brand or for a company, really I think it's what the customers say about us, as much as we can fabricate stories and so on, but um, eventually it's a value that we create uh, for our customers. Uh, speaking of which, I think I'd like to bring up this uh, fantastic story that I found out from uh, Faith. Uh, internal brand storytelling is not just necessarily just for internal, right? Because you're creating advocates out of your staff. And what they've did uh, recently, uh, I think a few months ago only, is that um, one of the problems that they face is that they have 400 uh, uh, staffs. And sometimes, you know, as a, such a big company, you, you kind of forget how it feels like to connect with your staff. So what they've done for, uh, I can't remember what day it was, but they've, uh, they've uh, Joel and, um, and I think a few of the leadership team drove to one of the staff's house to interview their parents. And that video, uh, I think a couple of guys, uh, and that video uh, was shared on social media and, and that, was, that went viral, that, that was talking about the heart of what fame is all about. So it's, just, it's about the people as well. So do you have something more to share about that? That was a brilliant thing. Yeah, we didn't burn it in the CDs. Uh, <laughs> that was, we made sure we didn't do that. You, you, I mean, uh, I mean that was a, that's a really great example of uh, how like you don't have to go far out. You know, think of something crazy like a, a whole rebrand uh, to tell a story. Something sometimes you can just look within and you find the best stories from there uh, to create the brand that you want. So okay, um, any other questions from the crowd? Oh yes, please. Yeah, let's go ahead. Hi, my question is for Jenny Boy and Stephen. So, um, 
I know the early days when you start as a YouTuber or a content creator, you get both kind of feedbacks, um, negative and positive. So I'll, I'll just go with the feedbacks where you don't feel very good and uh, the content isn't appreciated. So m my question is, how do you deal with that? And how did you dealt with that in the earlier days? Because I'm sure it's different when you started and how it is right now. So when a content fails, how do you manage that internally and also with your team? I'll start off and I will say that I, I really think when I first started making YouTube videos, the advice that I got was don't read the comments, just ignore everything, fight through it, don't listen to it. And then I realized that there is so much power in the comments and there's so much knowledge that if I'm willing to be, uh, I guess, be self-aware and accepting and understanding that people actually online, I would say actually most comments are very helpful and are providing helpful feedback. And that's actually what I think the internet thrives on as opposed to television. Television, you can make a, a whole season of stuff and you don't even know if people like it or not. But on the internet, you'll know right away that someone's gonna like it. Um, and so actually, the first thing is I think we, I think we love feedback and we, we actually try to read as much as we can so that we can understand and grow. And the second part of it is regarding failure. I, I realized working at BuzzFeed, the culture, is really to fail and fail fast and fail as much as you possibly can. Because that's, and actually when I make videos now, it's so easy to just, you know, repeat the same formula over and over again and just, you know, kind of be successful in that way. But the better key I think I've learned is to try new things and then see what was different about it. And sometimes you succeed, sometimes you exceed the expectations, or sometimes you fail. But when you fail, you actually learn twice as much as when you're uh, successful. So I, I really have learned to embrace quote unquote failure and seeing it more as a, a, a gateway to more information. Um, I, for me, I take every content that I upload on YouTube as a failure. <laughs> Because I always feel that, um, like for me, is I'm not okay. For me, is I'm not afraid to fail. Because when I was young, my mom made it such a huge deal that if you fail your exams, no girl is gonna come and date you. You're not gonna find a job and everything. So I've always been very afraid. I wasn't the best at studies. I didn't fail, but I did fail some. I graduated. I was not the best student. But somehow I've been invited to be on this stage to talk to very, very, to be on the same stage with really, really influential people. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's okay, you can clap, no problem. I like it. I like it when you clap. Clap again. I feel powerful. <laughs> so, where I'm really getting at is, um, a lot of people think that it's a huge deal to fail, but for me it was, I think from young, um, I've always thought that everything that I did was a failure. It's just that uh, I've never, the only thing, it's so cliche to say this, it's just that I never stopped, or I never gave up even though I failed, right? Because, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I'm in my tech talking to you guys. I've met so many amazing people around the world, such as Steven, I'm working with big brands, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, like a lot of people, Tend like I remember Chris telling me just now. Oh yeah, I need you to go up there and tell your success story. It's like, how am I a success story? I'm not. I don't understand. Whether, I don't understand whether I'm successful yet or not. So, um, failure is something that I'm not afraid of. I'm a, I'm always happy to fail because like what Steven said, you know, when you fail, you learn, and when you learn, you know, you do things that are obviously better. If you fail and you do something that's worse than your failure, then okay, please quit. But you know, never, no, never, no one's gonna fail and then repeat the same mistake again. If you're gonna date, if you're gonna date a girl that cheated on you, are you gonna date the same girl again? No, all right, or, or a guy. Sorry, in your case, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be equal here. Um, and for the other, uh, with regards to the other one, which is comments and negativity, like a very good example for, like, I'll share an example. Uh, I need everybody's participation over here. How many of you in this? I need you to put up, put up your hands, right? How many of you love? Oh wait, I gotta choose my question correctly. How many of you think Malaysian food is better than Singaporean food? 
and there are some people who did not put up their hands. In being in a country that's in Malaysia, that I would assume that everyone's Malaysian, I would have expected everybody to put up their hands. Yet, I could not influence 100% of everyone over here to say that Malaysian food is the best. Because why? Everybody is different and everybody has their own opinion. If I were to ask a question, any other different questions, it, the answers and the results will be different. So I never thought that. I never thought negative comments was a big deal for me. And I've ne I was never ever, I've never ever taken any of these personal comments to heart. And that's what I was from the start. Because you blocked them, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question is to both of you. So like, you know, Stephen, you, you work for an MNC, right? BuzzFeed under, you know, Universal Branding. So how different is a content creator in an MNC setting as opposed to like Genie, you know, you're an SME, you start up, you start from scratch. So how different in both your opinions, you know? And another question will be for Joel later. I'm sure there's a lot of similarities in what we're doing. Um, I will say the, the thing about working at BuzzFeed is that there is a bottom line, which is the profit. And so I have to think, okay, I'm a creative. I just want to, honestly, I went to this industry because I just want to make good content. I just want to be creative. But because I work at BuzzFeed, I have to find the small intersection of my desire and BuzzFeed's desire, because they're paying me a salary, and it's fair for them to ask me to do that, and see where that middle ground is. So I do think, like for example, the show that I make, is something where I can talk about my culture, but I had to frame it in a way that people would watch it, we'd have an audience, and BuzzFeed would see that there's value added to it. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure you're, for you, bottom line is important, even though, you know. But I guess, like, the distribution is different, right? Obviously, yeah, the, well, reach. actually, it's pretty similar because the way that you know BuzzFeed operates is we don't put money behind distributing content. We just put it on the platform and we rely on our consumers to share the content. And we found that you know when you do put money behind it, it actually can hurt your brand. So we want to try to create content that people will, will relate to. So in that way, I would probably, is that, is that for you too? Yeah, I think, um, we kind of like operate the same way because, well, maybe for Steven it's a little bit different for me is because I kind of don't work under an organization that has already a structured platform for you to kind of follow. I have to create that structure. And half the time I'm like, oh man, what do I do? I have to basically, okay, when I first started, I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna do this until the channel is not popular anymore and I'll shut it down, you know? So, so what, right? But when I started hiring employees and realized that their lives depend on me, and some of them are like, you know, gonna lead on to your lives and get married, when they tell me those things, I'm like, oh crap, I need to be irresponsible now. So that's where it's, you know, you need to make a lot of sacrifices. You need to make a lot of decisions. Initially, like for, for, for me, it's a little bit different because the brand was built out of my nickname. But right now, if you kind of notice that all the videos that we put up, you don't see my face. You know, why am I doing that? It's because I want it to sustain. I want people to come for the content, not the face. I mean, look, this guy has a face for radio. Go figure. You know, no one's gonna come back. And because of this beautiful, handsome face, by the way, was already taken and married, I have a kid. Um, so for me, it's <laughs> basically to build a brand for, like for me, it's, it, yes, it started with me. Yes, people knew it for me. But for me, as I'm slowly trying to walk away from the whole fact that people come and watch Ginny Boy TV because of the face. People are coming for the content. And that, it, you know, for me, what I'm trying to say is it gradually changes. It has to change. Time changes a lot. Uh, I do have an example. I think we, we do have more money to work with advertising and distribution. So there was a time when we actually made billboards for our show in America. But you know what? Those billboards had like very little effect to the show, which is interesting. It, it, even as much marketing dollars we can put in, at the end of the day, it's the storytelling that's gonna connect with people. And so we actually, we, you know, we stopped doing billboards, we stopped doing that kind of stuff because it's, it doesn't actually have an impact for, from our standpoint. And um, for Joel, just wondering, like you have uh, actually created two successful brands. I mean, there's three you mentioned on the screen, but I only know two. Sorry about that. So, so of the two, like you know, as a brand owner or creative, and how do you perceive influencers and you know, 
hard on the stories and content? Does it, you know, impact the brand? How do you perceive it from a brand owner perspective? Yeah, so I, I think the, the different take is uh, what is the objective of the brand, right, that we are creating. So oftentimes, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, as compared to say Jane or Steve, they are, you know, they've built a very strong personal brand. So I think the different challenges that they would face, uh, which is, for example, transitioning uh, when it's a skill, the company to be less dependent, right, on them. Uh, but whereas uh, in, in the case when you build a company uh, with such, in such way, it's not driven by a strong, uh, you know, external personal brand, uh, then really it's about asking a question, what is this company supposed to do? Uh, what value does it create? I think there was one simple question earlier was around how to make money, right? I think that's an interesting question. So I find maybe just to start with that, I mean, every business model needs to, uh, of course, you need to be passionate what you do and, and to start a company, but eventually this uh, question of how to make money would come in uh, as you need to sustain employees and, and to, to, to grow the business. Uh, actually, it's very simple. The answer is only there's only two ways that you actually make money as a as a business, right? First is either you help other people to make more money, or number two is you help other people to save more money, right? So, and that's something that you when you start a business or when you you kind of building a brand, you have to ask that question. And oftentimes, I think, um, so for example, um, content brands. So actually, Ref Asia is an advertising platform. So we've got like Sales.com, Obulan, and all this. Uh, we've got like five million Monday active users that that uh, assesses the platform. Oftentimes, actually, it's hard to make money for an, as an advertising platform because it's sometimes difficult to show the attribution of what we do that drives the revenue of a company, that helps them to make more money. So there's a like, typically advertising businesses, generally, it's, uh, you know, if it's not trackable, it, it's actually quite hard to scale. Uh, whereas uh, the biggest advertisers today that are making the most money is Google and Facebook because every single click Right, is tracked all the way attributed to a sale and, and, and it's a dollar. And that's where they're taking the majority of uh, the lion's share of advertising dollars. So, um, so in any business that you're in, really it's usually two things, right? It's either you're helping uh, your suppliers or your, your businesses or your partners kind of save money, or you're helping them to grow their business, right? Or, or to make money. So essentially, I think that's kind of um, you know, what, what drives uh, growth of a company. Thank you. I've, I've got this burning question while, you know, while this all is going on. Um, so all three of you are public faces of sorts. And you know, in brand storytelling, it's, it's sometimes about the, is, how do you differentiate between a brand and the owners? So is it important that the brand owners themselves play a role in the uh, brand storytelling of the brand? For example, uh, Joel, I mean, you you put out a, a birthday note, right? Every every time, every time you you you, you have your birthday, <laughs> and you know in that birthday note, it gets shared a hundred a uh, hundred times, two hundred times, and those are your learnings uh, in the things that you do. And some may say that this has also helped the fact that people believe in the brands that you work in. So is that really important, or can 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 we dissociate uh, a brand owner with the brand that he's supposed to go? Yeah, I think typically, you know, when a founder starts a company, it's usually there's a certain personal mission uh, associated with it. Uh, so for me, is I, I merely see a company as just a group of people that loves working with each other to, you know, to a common goal, right? Uh, and I always put kind of the group of people uh, as the first priority. So a lot of people that actually started with me in my early 20s, 10 years ago, is, is still working together with me, uh, even though we have built three different companies uh, together. So, um, so oftentimes when I build a company, I, uh, I start with a point of view where, uh, you know, I actually don't like meeting clients, you know, so I actually like spending time with my team. Um, and that's so why even oftentimes I don't really speak much in conferences and so on because, uh, you know, any moment I have, actually I, I love spending, spending time with my team. Uh, because the company is just a group of them that's all trying to achieve their personal goals collectively within the company, right? So. Um, yeah, so, and that's why like when I write birthday notes, I, it's mainly for me to reflect and share internally with uh, the team, right? Because eventually the team is going to be building the company, they, they'll be building uh, the platform, and is it technology or acquiring merchants or customers uh, and, and so on. Yeah. So, so you're saying that it is important uh, to have the founder, the, I mean, or, or the founders themselves, the leadership team, to play a role like, like Tony Fernandez and, and his companies and, you know, can we avoid it or? No, I, Absolutely. So I think a lot of times we um, really underestimate what companies can be in the long run, 
right? Because every large company that we see out there today all started as a small company. All started in a 500 square feet room with no windows. Right? Every single company, Apple to Google to Facebook, the ones that, that we know today. Right? So same thing, I think right, right now, you know, some of us here have like small, medium-sized companies, uh, but hopefully we'll see right, these companies to become uh, uh, giants in, in the future. So, um, you, you know, I, I think it, yeah, I think it's... Um, well, in my case, yes, it is important for the founder to sort of be a face for the whole company at first. In fact, in fact your name is part of the brand, isn't it? So. I know, it is, but... So is Johnny Walker, I'm pretty sure it's a name. So is one of the brands that revolves around a name, Hewlett Beckett. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, yes, it's, it revolves around my name, all right? Um, but it doesn't mean that I need to be there 100% of the time. I, I'm pretty sure, well, I'm not sure if how much everyone goes into the details of my videos, but all of the videos that you watch on my channel right now is not directed by me, it's not written by me, it's not produced by me, it's not, I don't do anything. I know it's made me sound like a lazy person, but you know why I do that? It's because I'm giving an opportunity for upcoming and rising directors and producers to basically come on my platform and tell stories. My team, the youngest person is 23 years old, and he produced his first movie. And why, why do I allow that? Because if he's going to basically go out and work for a production house, it's probably going to be a personal assistant, it's going to be a PA, it's going to be an intern. He's probably not going to be basically rising up the, the production ladder in, you know, in another like four or five years. For me, as I believe and I invest very heavily in the younger culture, the younger mindset. Because in my, well, I mean for different businesses, it's different, right? Uh, maybe for your company, you, involve, you invest more in people who are very well versed in tech. For me, is I very much well invest in the younger generation who are creative. Because what is creative and what is interesting to you may not be interesting to the younger generation. And what they find interesting, like dabbing or the bottle flip, may not be interesting to people like us. And for me, it's I have a brand that has to be kept relevant to the pop culture. So that's why I always give an opportunity for the team. And I really love my team because they're the ones who basically run the entire show for the channel today. And um, if you do watch any of our films, I mean, Please do leave a comment and congratulate some of the people who direct our films because they work really, really hard um, to basically put out something that is really, really high quality for everyone to watch. And it is absolutely free of charge for you guys to watch. Yes, Stephen? Yeah, I can just add a little bit. Um, I do think that, you know, people say when they invest in businesses, they invest in people, they invest in the founders. And I will say, you know, as we've developed our small team with Worth It and, and as we're building uh, our own brands, the one thing that I have come back to is that it's most important to have this overarching vision that everybody can latch on to. And that's something that we cannot connect to. And um, I've always heard like, I don't know if this is actually true. I'm not married, so I don't know. But I've heard that marriages that you know have a, a, a higher common goal oftentimes can be more successful, You know, whether that's a kid or whether that's um, a belief or something. And I think that's actually can be also true with businesses as well and with visions. Um, because I think ultimately when you're building a team and you're, and you're trying to do that, you, you really have to have this higher common goal, otherwise the whole thing will fall apart. Okay, um, any other questions from here? All right, that's the lady behind. Someone get the mic to her, please. On the left. Any mic? Okay, um, right, I think uh, uh, the microphone's off. coming. Sorry, skip, skip. Okay, there's someone running over. Let's get ready. Prepare the questions. <laughs> there you go. You can always uh, appreciate the host on board, right? So they can keep this at the team. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I think this is more for Joel, or if any of you think that you can answer this question. Um, so when you start brands, obviously you start with a story, right? 
So, and as you continue growing your brand, growing your company, how do you stay with your brand story? Yeah, how do you stay with your own convictions of your brand story and how does it evolve? How do you grow with it? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, that's actually the most difficult uh, part of being a founder of, of a brand that where you employ a lot of people. Um, so maybe I'll give you, uh, I'll share with you a part where it was the most difficult for us. Um, so the first founding group uh, that started Fave, actually we started not, we didn't start Fave first. We actually started this company called KFit, which was a fitness platform. Uh, so we started in 2015, our investors invested in that. Uh, very quickly we realized that the business model was not sustainable and uh, we needed to pivot. So we've just raised 12 million US dollars and we knew that if every single month, if we do not pivot it, uh, that do every dollar is going to go to waste, right? Um, so one day we had to group uh, all, the, all our team members together, probably about uh, 100 people across 12 countries, right? So they dialed in and we had to tell them that uh, we had to evolve uh, the platform from not just serving fitness, uh, people interested, uh, you know, to be fit and gyms and studios to uh, the larger population, right? And we had to pivot the business model. Uh, that was probably the most difficult day of, you know, that, that entire journey so far. Uh, because there were a lot of people that joined the company. Uh, more than half joined it because they believed in the, you know, helping people to get fit, right? Uh, they believed, uh, and a lot of them were personal trainers, uh, you know, they, they would exercise themselves, they were teaching people how to get fit, how to lose weight. Um, and it was quite strange, after we did the all hands, uh, it was quiet. We asked for Q&A, uh, nobody had a question, except one person, which was an intern. So the first thing she put up her hand and she asked is, will we work with KFC? And uh, we didn't know what to answer, right? Because, um, you know, we didn't expect that question. And uh, my co-founder was kind of slightly more overweight. He said, yeah, actually KFC is my favorite food, right? So not the most, uh, you know, uh, well-groomed answer. And the intern said, I'm quitting, <laughs> right? So, and that's why I think a lot of times for companies, um, and as what Steve mentioned, what is that overarching mission is really important. Uh, sometimes companies need to make pivots, right? So think of uh, companies that did not make pivots, like Kodak or like Nokia, right? Uh, they are gone today, right? So at certain points of times, uh, you know, companies that, you know, after five years, ten years in technology space, you realize they evolve very quickly, right? One day you're using it to book cars, next day is food is coming to be delivered to you, and the next day is that I can now pay my bills. Um, so that mission, that overarching mission, somewhat evolves, and uh, the challenge for fast-growing companies or technology companies is uh, how do we ensure that, uh, you know, that kind of stays true? Because the only reason why great people join the company is because of their overarching mission and the teamwork. Uh, so that's a struggle for any founder or you know, any leadership team uh, that's part of a fast-growing company. Right, and uh, you know, I think, I think it's good to summarize whatever was said just now. Um, more importantly, I think we can all agree that a brand always moves, it always changes. And it changes to uh, not because we want it to change, but because it's what the consumers or the, what the fans are looking for. And if this doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen fast enough, or, uh, uh, or it doesn't happen in, uh, in, in the right way, uh, I would say, uh, then you, you, you have a lot to lose. Uh, in fact, I would like to think that, you know, from the beginning I started this conversation at the fact that with good storytelling, you actually save a lot of money. But in fact, in, in, in other words, you actually save a lot of resources. And um, I think, uh, I hope that a lot of us here today have gotten something from our speakers today. So I think without further ado, I would like to end this uh, conversation. Um, there will be a uh, VIP after this, but we will be around. So if you'd like to stay, uh, stay on further after the entire session, we can find us uh, behind at the networking session. So with that, I'll pass back the mic to Tasneem. Thank you. Can we give them a big, big round of applause? Thank you, Chris. And all of our speakers, Stephen, Ginny Boy, and also Joel. Thank you very much. And now, let's take a picture. Where is our official photographer? It's always missing. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's there. All right. I strike a pose. One for the camera.
and you can also tweet this moment eh? because what you tweet here will be displayed here so we'll be sharing it later Okay, what do you call that thing? Love thing? Yes, yeah, spread love. Yes! <laughs> Alright, so once again, ayo kita berikan tepukan gemuruh untuk speaker-speaker kita dan juga mari kita. Terima kasih.